بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلوات الله وسلامه على نبيه الكريم عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My brothers and my sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, For those of you that are on YouTube give me one second I'm just going to wipe the lens inshallah sorry I should have done that before the class alhamdulillah um, I hope that everyone is doing well, insha'Allah ta'ala. It is uh, Sunday, August 15th, 2021, and uh, we're going through our essential fiqh class. We're continuing the chapter on foods. We looked at the types of foods or animals that are not permissible. Um, the animals that are not permissible to eat, uh, that's what we looked at last week. Um, and we also learned that no food is forbidden except for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forbidden for us to eat, um, either from what is mentioned in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet. Uh, like I mentioned last week, I'm not going to be talking specifically about like biryanis and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure as we go along, especially from today, you're going to start to have a little more uh, questions and maybe some curiosity as to the Islamic rulings of certain uh, aspects of food and drink and, you know, what's halal and haram within the deen. Today, inshallah, in fact, what we left off with uh, discussing last week was a prohibition of consuming donkeys and then also the prohibition of consuming fanged beasts of prey and birds with talons. Uh, we also looked at how it's not permissible to consume carrion, which is, you know, the... Uh, an, uh, an animal or a part of an animal that was severed from the animal uh, or the actual animal itself that has died. So basically it is the, the decaying flesh of an animal or a part of an animal. Um, today we start with looking at the prohibition of consuming al-jallala. Okay, jallala. What is jallala? Jallala is an animal that eats from impure things. So the majority of what the animal consumes is food that is impure. That doesn't mean that the animal consumes only impure foods, but it could mean that the majority of what that animal consumes uh, is not pure, okay? Uh, it's forbidden within Islam to eat these animals and it doesn't matter if the animal is an animal that is permissible to eat or not. If the animal is from the animals that are permitted to eat, for example, uh, you know, a sheep or a goat or a cow or a camel, and it is eating from what is impure, then it is not permissible. So, for example, if you see, uh, you know, a sheep going over to um, animal waste, right, like the uh, feces of another animal and starts to eat that, then that is impure, okay? So that's what's uh, implied here and what we are uh, discussing. So it's forbidden to eat those animals, it's forbidden to drink their milk, and also it can be forbidden to ride them as animals to ride, okay? How do we know this? Well, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the meat and milk of al-jallala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the uh, meat, to eat the meat or to drink the milk of an animal that consumes impure foods. Okay, The majority of what they eat is impure. Um, he also said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, sorry, he also said, who is he? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he also said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade al-jallala camels, including riding them or drinking their milk. So he forbade them to be eaten, forbade for us to ride them, and forbade us from drinking their milk. Okay, so that's with regards to an animal. Now this is rare, it's extremely rare. Um, but it does happen. So if someone says, well, I was at the farm and I noticed that the animal was eating hay and from amongst the hay that it was eating, there was there was one piece of dropping from, you know, another animal, right? A small little piece of, let's say, sheep droppings, right? And um, the animal was eating from the hay and then consumed this one piece. 
well, Islamically, we, we, we look at it and say, well, you know, it's not the majority of what this animal is eating. This animal is not inclined towards going and eating, you know, the droppings of another animal. The animal is inclined towards eating hay, and that's what it's eating. The majority of what it eats is something that is good. If the majority of what it's eating is something that is impure and not permitted, then that's where the animal would be considered jalala and not permitted for us to eat the flesh of it, the meat, or to consume its milk. And as we see in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, narrated by uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade al-jallala camels, including riding them or drinking their meat. So when does a jallala animal become permissible? Does it mean that an animal that eats impure foods is always and forever impure for us to consume even though it's an animal that if we are to sacrifice in a halal permitted way uh, becomes permissible for us when does that animal become permitted for us to eat so if such an animal is retained and kept for three days okay and it eats only pure foods then it is permissible to slaughter it or sacrifice it and eat it uh, it is narrated by, uh, it was narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma that he used to, uh, sorry, it was narrated that Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma used to restrain and keep jalala chickens for three days, as in he used to keep them within, you know, a certain area and feed them pure good foods that is, you know, uh, good for them to eat, of course. Uh, so you used to keep these jalala chickens for three days, right? Okay, uh, so that's where we get the three days from. That Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he used to see those chickens that may eat something that isn't good, and he would keep them in a certain area, feeding them only good, pure, you know, foods, grain, or whatever it was that he was feeding them. Uh, all right, we move on. The permissibility of eating anything that is forbidden due to necessity. So can we eat something that is generally or typically haram? When are the times that we can eat it if we can eat it? Okay, so let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah. Um, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 173. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim فَمَنِ اضْطَرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, But if one is forced by necessity without willful disobedience nor transgressing the limits, then there is no sin on him. Truly Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but as for him who is forced by severe hunger, with no inclination to sin, um, then one can eat these meats, right, that are mentioned above, uh, as in, in the ayah, the previous uh, ayat, first and second ayah, refer to uh, the animals that are not permitted to eat. So we'll go back and mention the ayah. But as for him who is forced by severe hunger with no inclination to sin, um, then surely Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us in a state of necessity to eat what is haram for the purpose of survival. Now let's look at the commentary of Ibn Kathir rahimahullah. There's a few things that he points out here. So first of all, uh, this verse uh, means that if one is in need of partaking of any of those forbidden foods mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to an immediate necessity, then he is allowed to eat them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, is forgiving and merciful. So if a person is in dire need of, of eating food that is haram in order to survive, don't say, oh, 
uh, you know, uh, since lunch, I haven't eaten anything. So I just need some bacon right now. Since lunch, you're not in a dire need. Okay. You're not at a state where you absolutely need to eat right now. Okay. So if it's, uh, you know, an absolute necessity, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful. Uh, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the condition of his worshippers. So Allah knows the state or condition that we are in and he knows if we are in a real difficult time and we need help uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the food that is in front of us that may be haram or you may be stranded somewhere and you find let's say a wild boar and you uh, you know catch it, you can consume it if it is a necessity, an absolute necessity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlooks that. In Musnad of Imam Ahmad and in Sahih ibn Hibban, it's recorded on the authority of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily Allah loves that one resorts to his exemptions. Allah loves that one resorts to his exemptions in the same way that he dislikes for one to resort to disobeying him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that when we are in a state of need, a necessity, regardless of what it is, right? Regardless of what it is. If we are in a state of need of something, for example, someone is in a dire need to combine prayers for whatever reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the condition of the person. And if that person is fulfilling what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, based on a exemption within the deen that is not the norm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we take advantage of those excep uh, exceptions within the deen or exemptions, we could say, within the deen, because we are in a state of need, okay? So Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he continues and he says, thus the jurists say that eating carrion would, under some circumstances, be obligatory, such as if the person fears for his life and finds no other food. So if a person fears that they would die of hunger and starvation, then at that point in time, it becomes permissible to eat what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram for us to eat and consume, despite it being haram, because our life is more important to try to preserve than to say, oh no, Allah has not made this halal for me, so I can't eat it. Even if I die, I'm not going to eat it. That's actually ignorance. That's ignorance, right? And lack of knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could also be recommended or permissible, depending on the circumstances that a person is going through. The jurists differ over the question of whether the person is to eat only as little as meets his or her hunger, or if he or she is allowed to fill his stomach, or if he or she is allowed to fill his or her stomach and keep extra food with them as provisions. So the difference of opinion amongst the scholars is not that it's not permissible or is permissible. No, they all say that it is permissible. Some say that it, it could be uh, recommended depending on the circumstance and others say that it is an absolute must that you know you have to eat and of course we have to at that point in time when it comes to life and death um, but what the scholars do differ on is the amount that a person should eat should the person eat just enough to maintain their life or should the person eat until they are full like you know you go to your favorite restaurant and you know, they serve you free food, right? And it's all you can eat for free of your favorite food. And you know how we fill ourselves when we eat? Well, it, that's where the scholars differ. Should we eat from what's impermissible in the condition that we are in, which is dire, right? We may not survive. And all that is present is haram food or food that is forbidden for us to consume. The scholars say, or the scholars differ on whether we are allowed to eat just enough in order to nourish ourselves or can we eat to our full to our fill or can we eat to our fill and keep some for uh, our own provisions later on okay that's where they differ so no one differs on the fact that we need to make sure that we you know eat uh, in order to 
stay alive. Bismillah. Um, there are different views on these questions as discussed in the books of fiqh. Um, it's not a precondition for eating carrion that one must go three days as some may think. Some feel, hey, you know what? If you haven't had food for three days, then you can eat what's haram. No, it's not a precondition. If you fear for your life, despite the amount of days, and of course it has to actually be like a significant amount of time, then that's where it becomes permitted. Um, let's move on, inshallah ta'ala. All right, let's look at a new uh, part of this chapter. Islamic manner of slaughtering animals or sacrificing animals. Uh, I will try to get through all of this, inshallah ta'ala, before we end for Salat al-Isha, if we have time. If we don't have time, then we'll continue next week inshallah okay uh, but it's nice if we try and just cram it all in together actually it might be nice if we just space it out where we have some time for q a afterwards and then you know give us some time for uh covering the rest of it next week and some questions as well uh just remember those of you that may have uh, some questions on the topic that we're discussing today or you know general questions then feel free to type them in uh, sometime soon, inshallah ta'ala. Don't wait until uh, we start asking because then that's usually when people forget their questions or we have to sit there and just wait for questions to be typed in. All right, so the Islamic manner of slaughtering or sacrificing animals. The word uh, okay? Uh, illa ma dhakaytum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa ma dhakaytum. Linguistically speaking, if we were to talk about this word linguistically, uh, it has the meaning of purifying something or making something good. Okay, purifying something and making something good. Thus, if one was to say uh, there is a zakiya smell, a zakiya smell, that means that there is a pleasant, good scent or smell. Okay, like the pleasant good smell that you can't smell right now from my office because there's perfume in the air freshener. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, right? Um, Islamically, right, in the Sharia, ah, we've borrowed this word as we saw, you know, as I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa ma We borrowed this term and we use it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it in the Quran, uh, referring to, you know, slaughtering an animal, uh, making it permissible according to the sharia ah, uh, and good and pure to eat, okay, halal to eat. Um, so, therefore, we discuss now the animals or the manner with which we are to sacrifice animals within Islam. The exception to this, though, is of course fish and locusts okay because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, sorry the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said as we saw in the hadith that we took last week uh, that there are uh, two things uh, that are permitted two animals that are permitted we could say or two types of animals and uh, two types of blood the two types of animals are fish or what's found in the sea and um, locusts and the two types of blood are, what are they? You know what they are. Type it in, type it in. Let's see who remembers. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Maytatani and Damani, right? Two things that if they die, we're allowed to eat. They're halal for us. We don't have to say Bismillah Allahu Akbar and sacrifice them or slaughter them. And two types of blood. What are they? Type them in whoever remembers. Let's see who remembers from amongst you.
who remembers? Liver and spleen, very good, Muhammad Zafar. Right, liver and spleen, very good. So KQQKKQ says fish and locusts, very good. Uh, Sana says liver, liver and spleen, good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, good. At least we have a few people that are paying attention and uh, keeping track of the knowledge that we are acquiring. Remember, I always encourage that we write things down, right? Write things down. Um, very beautiful uh, clip that I was showing my wife the other day uh, from Sheikh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al Abad al Badr, um, one of our teachers, one of my teachers from Medina. Um, uh, there is this video clip on YouTube that I saw last week of him giving a lecture in Indonesia. And he had a, a brother or another Sheikh graduate who was translating for him. So Sheikh Abdul Razak was speaking and, uh, you know, the other Sheikh, the Indonesian Sheikh was translating. And at the end, uh, Sheikh Abdul Razak asked, uh, you know, a question to the people and said, who, who remembers, who can list the items that we mentioned, right? And he looked around and there was like hardly anyone. In fact, you don't see any hands go up. And then you see, you know, a brother. And then he goes, the sheikh goes, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not even going to choose from the people who might think that they know. He says, I'm going to ask this person. He says, I'll choose someone. So he chooses this elderly man who's sitting, you know, a few feet away from the table that the sheikh is in. And there's like hundreds of people sitting around, maybe even thousands. Allah So uh, he asked the sheikh, uh, he asks the old man. And of course, you know, the sheikh says it in Arabic and then it's translated, right? So he says, can you list the things? And so the old man, he lists the things and then the, the items that they discussed. Then the sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Razak, he says, you know why I asked him? And you know why he knows the answer? He says, because from the beginning of the halakat, from the beginning of the class, he says, all I've noticed from this, from this uncle, right? From this old man is that he hasn't put his pen down from writing all of the knowledge that we are conveying. Everything that the Sheikh was saying, this old man was writing it down, writing it down, flipping the page, writing it down, writing it down, flipping the page, writing it down, writing everything that the Sheikh was saying. And so he says, I know that he knows the answer because he wrote it all down and he preserved it. And so the Sheikh, you know, rewarded that, uh, that old man, elderly man that was sitting there um, by taking off his watch and giving it to him. And he gave it to him as a gift. Uh, and he said, and I'll give him another gift uh, when I get back to my hotel, right? Because he left his, uh, you know, his stuff in the room. And he said, when I go back, I'll get it for him. So subhanAllah, you know, that's an indication that nowadays when you have large gatherings of people learning knowledge, still we find that it's very rare for us to write things down. And we are not like the Arabs of the time of the Prophet Sallallahu who would listen to what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say and memorize it, right? We are people who don't remember every single word that is said. What did I just finish saying? We are people who don't remember every single word that is said, right? So it's important for us to try to preserve this knowledge. And sometimes years later, we might say, hey, you know what? I remember we were talking about this once in the fifth class. What was it? And then you can easily refer back to your notes, okay? All right. So we asked the question, what are the exemptions? The exemptions to the rule of sacrificing or slaughtering something is uh, maytatan and daman, two things that if they die, uh, we can still eat them, fish and locusts. And daman, the two, two types of blood is liver and spleen. Very good, alhamdulillah. So whose slaughtering is acceptable? Whose slaughtering is acceptable? If someone slaughters something for us, can we eat it based on who that person is? Meat is made permissible by the slaughtering done by any Muslim or one from the people of the book, whether they are male or female. Okay, I'll say this again. 
meat or an animal becomes permissible for us as Muslims to consume, it becomes halal for us from the animals that are halal for us to consume if they are sacrificed or slaughtered in a halal manner, okay, they become permissible for us by the slaughtering that is done by any Muslim or one from the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? The Jewish and the Christians. Whether they are male or female. So whether the person is Muslim or the person is Jewish or the person is Christian, whether they are male or female, doesn't matter. If they are the ones who sacrifice it, slaughtered it, then it becomes halal for us. Okay. Of course, not if they sacrificed it in the name of something or someone else. We're talking about it being sacrificed according to the way that uh, the Muslims and, of course, the Jewish and the Christian see permitted, okay? Which is in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the name of God, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number five of Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ وَطَعَامُكُمْ حِلُّ لَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the food of the people of the book, the Jewish and the Christians, is lawful to you. So the food of the Jewish and the Christians is lawful for us. And I know as soon as I mention this, we're going to see lots of questions coming through, right? Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah said their food refers to their slaughtered animals. Their food refers to their slaughtered animals. Ka'ab ibn Malik stated that a woman slaughtered a sheep with a stone. The Prophet ﷺ was asked about that and he said, tell her to eat it. Tell her to eat it. As in, it is halal, it's permissible. Okay, Even though you used a stone, not a knife, a sharp stone, it still is permissible. Okay, Tell her to eat it. So we see here that the food of the Muslims and the Jewish and the Christians is halal for the Muslims to consume, of course, so long as it was sacrificed in the name of God, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ka'ab ibn Malik, of course, mentions that uh, the example of the woman who slaughtered the sheep with a stone and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that it is permissible and tell her to eat it. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah said about وَطْعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ The food of the people of the book, the Jewish and the Christians, is lawful for you. He said their food refers to their slaughtered animals from amongst the animals that are permissible for us to eat. Okay, so one can't say, oh, here's a pig that was sacrificed, slaughtered by a Christian friend, right? It's permit. no, it's not permissible. Okay, it's not permissible because the animal itself, despite it being sacrificed by someone of the book, the animal itself is something that is haram to be consumed, okay? All right, instruments used for the slaughtering. What can we use to slaughter an animal within Islam? It is permissible to slaughter with any instrument that will cut the throat except for teeth or claws. Okay, so when we say Bismillah Allahu Akbar, it has to be able to cut through the throat, the jugular veins as well, uh, except for teeth and claws. So a knife, a sharp stone, whatever it is that you're using that's sharp has to be sharp. Okay, it has to be sharp. We are not allowed to torture or put extra pain upon the animal. Okay, so it's permissible to slaughter an animal Islamically with any instrument that will cut the throat except for teeth and claws. Uh, it was narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, O Messenger of Allah, we do not have a knife. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said, whatever causes the blood to flow and has had Allah's name mentioned upon it, you may eat it, uh, you may eat as long as it were not a claw or a tooth. The claw is the knife of the Ethiopians, and the tooth is a bone. Okay. Shaddad ibn Aus said two statements I remember exactly from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Verily, Allah has prescribed excellence in all things. Thus, if you kill, 
kill in a good manner. If you slaughter, slaughter in a good manner. Each of you should sharpen his blade and spare suffering to the animal he is slaughtering. Okay? So, Islamically, we see that, you know, it might even be, for example, an animal that, um, you know, needs to be put down or, uh, you know, something harmful, whatever it is, right? We make sure that we don't cause extra harm uh, when sacrificing or slaughtering that animal that we are going to consume, okay? The manner of slaughtering. How do we actually slaughter? Okay. Should we stop here and open it up for questions? I think we should. Okay. So we'll stop here and open it up for questions, inshallah, and we'll continue from the manner of slaughtering next week. Okay. We also have to look at the status of the fetus. Like, can we eat a fetus that is found within the belly of the animal? Okay. Um, what do we say? when the animal is being sacrificed? What direction do we face in when sacrificing an animal? Okay, so that's what we'll cover next week, inshallah ta'ala. We'll open it up for some questions now. I'm pretty sure there's gonna be quite a few questions because whenever we're talking about food, there's always a lot of questions that come in. So while you type out your questions, I'm going to just mark in my book where we're stopping, inshallah. Any questions? I know there was one question that came in here. I'll just quickly open that up. So one of the questions was, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh, quick question. Why is everything below the water considered halal, although it may fall victim to the same impurities as land animals? Okay, so we might assume that it... Um, that it uh, has similar impurities, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah is the one who created us and created everything that exists, right? So uh, we leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah made something permissible and uh, it is found within the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we accept it. Not everything in life has to make sense. Okay, not everything in life has to make sense. It doesn't have to be logical. And here's an example. When making wudu and wiping over our feet or our socks, right? Let's say a person made wudu and they put socks on and uh, they're making wudu now at a later point in time after putting their socks on. What part of the foot do we, would we assume we have to wipe over? So naturally, we assume that we're going to be wiping over the bottom of the foot because that's the part of the foot that gets dirty. Right, we'd be wiping over the bottom of the sock, but Islamically we don't. We wipe over the top of the sock. Someone says, "Well, what's what's the logic behind that?" Not everything needs to be logical, right? Not everything needs to be logical. Okay, whatever the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam encourages us to do, we do. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions here. Um, don't see any questions there. Uh, when it says people of the book, how can I know of, how can I know of what? If the Christian has mentioned either to God or Jesus. Okay. This is where we have to keep in mind that, first of all, the worshipping of Jesus, Isa, or rendering him a uh, one to be worshipped by the Christians was also present during the time of the Prophet How do we know this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran um, that they refer to him as, you know, the Trinity. Okay, Don't say that, you know, Allah is three or God is three, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So that was something that already existed during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, uh, there were much more religious Christians 
at the time. And when I say by much more religious, I mean like they were concentrated, like the group of Christians, they were religiously practicing Christians. Just like nowadays when you have, you know, Muslims, people say I'm Muslim, but you don't see any Islam on them. You say, do you fast? No, I don't fast. Okay. Uh, do you pray? No, I don't pray. Okay. Are you Muslim? Yeah, I'm Muslim. This is what people say, right? Um, without getting into the Islamic ruling, whether whether these people actually are Muslim or not, um, you know, the claim is there. So what I encourage us to do is, first of all, look for halal food, as in food that came from the Muslim. Okay? Halal food that came from the Muslim. When we say halal food, we have to keep in mind that Allah made the food of the Jewish and the Christians halal for us. So halal food doesn't mean food that came from a Muslim solely. Okay? Halal food is food that Allah has permitted for us. And this is where I know when we get into this discussion, as Muslims, we sometimes go in circles, and that's because we are uncomfortable with something. And that's fine. That's fine. Why? Because within Islam, we have this concept of ihsan. To worship Allah as though you see him. But even though we don't see him, know that he sees us. What does that mean? That means that we try to do things as best as we possibly can. I could, I could take this water and drink it. I could drink it like this. Bismillah. Or I could take this water and go, I don't really care why I'm drinking this water and start pouring it up from up here with my mouth open in the air. Am I drinking water? Yes. In the first example, am I drinking water? Yes. Is one method better than the other? Yes. Okay. So I always encourage that we do what is better, what is best, and especially looking at what is more pure. The food coming from the Muslim is usually more pure in the sense that we have less doubt. We shouldn't have any doubt to begin with, right? Because if a Muslim is giving us food, then it's halal for us. And this is where, sadly, within our own communities, we start to make problems, right? We start to say, oh, a Muslim is serving me food, but it's not halal. But if the Muslim is serving you food, it's their responsibility to make sure that it's halal. Otherwise, shouldn't there be an issue with the Muslim? Right? A Muslim is a Muslim. And of course, we are all at different levels of Iman. But Islamically, we have a responsibility to inquire about the food that we consume. But if we know someone is a Muslim, trustworthy, alhamdulillah, and they're serving us, like, for example, sometimes people come to my house as well, and they will ask, uh, David, if you don't mind me asking, where do you, where do you buy it? Where did you get this you know, meat from? Where did you get this chicken from? Is that not offensive? Especially as someone who's considered like, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us sincere and genuine, but someone who's considered to be one of the imams of a community, like to ask that question. If we are doubting the leaders and the food that they're giving, then there's a problem either with the leaders or there's a problem with us, right? Either there's a problem with the leadership or there's a problem with the community and the knowledge and the education that we have. And so therefore, you know, when we talk about this topic, I know we could talk about it for a long time. And this is why I was saying, I think we should stop here and, you know, continue uh, next week and open it up for questions. So again, now here's here's something for undersco uh, undiscovered Isabel. Undiscovered. <laughs> um, interesting name. Um, if one is going to, if if a person is traveling the world, and they stop in certain countries, okay, and there are zero Muslims around. Okay, let's just assume that there are no Muslims, no halal food at all, zero at all, doesn't exist. And you go to Texas. Okay, 
would you consider the food in Texas or in the United States to be food from the people of the book? Okay. Answer. I'm waiting for your answers. Would you consider, again, there's no Muslims there and no halal food from a Muslim or halal meat store or anything of that sort. Okay. And you go to a nice steak restaurant because it's all you can find. Okay. And you're in Texas or somewhere in the United States. Would you consider, generally speaking, the food that comes to you, the meat or the chicken or whatever, to be permitted, permissible for you to eat? And not out of necessity, dire need, right? Talking about people of the book. I know. I know someone would say you could still eat vegetables, you can get sushi, you can eat fish. No, no, we're talking about the steak. I'm talking about steak, beef steak, okay? Nice veal, tender, very soft, very pink, you know, beautiful, soft, tender veal, okay? So Farhana says you are allowed to eat it, okay? Anyone else? Anyone else? Khalas, come on, you got to answer this. There's at least uh, 20, 30, at least about 30 families watching, right? Yalla, I want some answers. To stay safe, you'll probably stay away from meat because you're not sure. Okay. Anyone else? Omar says, no, you can't eat it. Why can't you eat it? Imam Shu'aib says, Texan steak, yummy. Now the fatwa is another issue. You're making us hungry. <laughs> okay. So again, in the example, you go to Texas, United States. There are no Muslims and no halal places, no halal meat, nothing available. You have a choice to eat this steak. So generally speaking, we look at what's the norm religion or faith in that area okay drive to another state <laughs> drive to another state talk about no muslims in the entire united states okay uh so if that was the case look you go to texas or generally across the united states people are christian now here's another example you come to you get on a plane and you fly to Thailand. You fly to Thailand. No, there's no vegetarian food, Anushe. Stop opening the doors of like waswasa. <laughs> okay, good. So Sana Khan says they're Christian. All right. And then she says, what's the question? Okay, sorry. Okay, so now you get on the plane and you fly to Thailand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Thailand. There are no Muslims and no halal food, no halal restaurant, nothing. But you're in Thailand. Your general thought in your mind is, I can eat the food of Ahlul Kitab. I'm in Thailand. Would the food generally be halal for you in Thailand? Remember, we eliminated all the Muslims from the equation. Thailand. No, she, I'm coming to that soon, okay? So you're in Thailand. Are you, what would you think? Based on Thailand today without any of the Muslims. Okay, no, she says no. Anyone else? Allah, come on, hurry up. It's almost time for Isha. Okay, Tasneem says no. Light spread says no. No, we're not talking about the survival eating. We're not talking about the survival eating. We're talking about you just landed, you know, can you eat? Okay, no to Thailand. Okay, no. Okay. Okay. Why are you thinking no? See, now I'm probing your thoughts. You're starting to think. Why are you saying no? You're saying no because you're thinking in your mind, the majority faith that is followed there is not Christianity and it's not Judaism. And we eliminated the Muslims from the, from the, the you know, the, the question. So the majority is not Ahlul Kitab. Okay. Therefore, no we wouldn't be able to just go to the grocery store, supermarket, wherever it is, and just buy meat and eat it. Because most likely that animal was slaughtered by someone who is not Christian and not Jewish. 
Okay. Now you get on an airplane and you fly to Medina, Medina to Munawwara. Okay. Can you eat the meat and the chicken that is in Medina to Munawwara, in Medina, in the Haram area, as in within the Haram boundaries, right? Can you eat the meat? That is in Medina. And yes, in this question, this part of the question, the Muslims do exist and the Muslims are there. Okay, of course, it's Medina. So what do you think? Yes or no? Can you eat the meat from a restaurant or store in Medina? Medina to Munawwara. Okay, what do you say? Farhana says yes. Noshi says absolutely. Idris Bai says yes. Sana says yes. Danish says yes. Sadaf says yes. Would you, after knowing what you know, <laughs> I like I like light speeds, uh, light spread. Sorry, light spreads um, response. The only thing you do is eat, <laughs> right? Go there and eat halal, halal, right? Okay. Now this is where Imam Shuaib has opened the door to Shaytan. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is where I have beef with people. Beef, literally, I have beef with people who go to Medina and they say, we can't eat the meat of Medina. And I know people personally, 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 who've been in Medina. I was with them and they're walking around looking for dal and they're looking for roti and they're looking for sabzi. And I'm like, yar, kyo? <laughs> Why are you walking around looking for dal and roti and sabzi? Go eat some nice food. Hadakumullah. Right? Why? In your minds now, you're thinking, wait a second, the food based on what we learned, right? So we took the example of, of Texas, US, generally the United States. Then we flew to Thailand and we're like, no, no, majority Buddhist. So no, we're not going to be eating there because there's no food of Ahlul Kitab. It's not the norm. Then you fly to Medina and it's like, we can't eat this food either because this food is imported. Who's importing it? Who's making sure? Who's, who's responsible for those standards? The Muslim. Now we're doubting the Muslim and we're doubting the the, the Lajna, we're doubting, no, you know, I don't want to get into the, and if any Imams are watching this other than Imam Shaib, I know Imam Shaib likes to sprinkle salt on the wounds, right? <laughs> but uh, subhanAllah, you know, when we think of this, the Muslim is offering you food, now you're going again, and this is what I said, you come to my house and you question, or I go to your house and I start to question you, where did you get this meat from? I'm not going to eat it until you tell me, Do, should I be doing this? Right? So KFC outside of the Haram doesn't stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken. It stands for Kaaba Facing Chicken. Okay, Kaaba Facing Chicken, not Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's Kaaba Facing Chicken. Okay, and chicken that was sacrificed facing the Kaaba is halal. <laughs> okay, um, Subhanallah. Uh, so I know, I know, I know. Uh, one day in the future, this video is probably going to give me some issues with other imams and probably be spread and used in different ways. And people are going to cut it up and chop it and probably send it out. And I, I ask you not to do that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, protect and save us all. Uh, context is important. But generally speaking, my brothers and sisters, mm. I've given you the tools now to think in your mind. Okay. You went from Texas to Thailand to Medina. Now you get on the plane. Okay, we have a few more minutes. You get on the plane and you fly to Canada. You fly to Canada. Would you eat the meat? There are no Muslims, no halal food, nothing, right? No Muslims around, no halal food, no halal restaurant. Would you eat the meat in Canada? Would you eat the meat in Canada? Ya Allah, I want to see answers. Okay, I want to see answers. Would you eat the meat in Canada? There's no Muslims, no halal. Remember, we're going back to it. No Muslims, no halal. Would you eat the meat in Canada? No, she says yes. 
Sana says no. Okay, Tasneem just, you know, has to be a little more patient. <laughs> um, Farhana says, uh, she says she will eat it. Idris Bai says, mostly Christian people, and they are people of the book. Uh, Atif Bai says, only filet fish <laughs> Remember, I said there's no seafood. We're talking about steak. Yeah, we're talking about steak. Okay. And there's no kosher certified. Okay. I know. No, we'll leave the kosher in there. Okay. Sarah says, yes. Okay. The majority, here's, here's, here's something interesting that we need to look into now. The majority faith or identity of Canadians, the majority of Canadians identify as, it used to be Christians, the majority now identify as atheists. So the majority identify as atheists. Do you feel comfortable eating the meat? I give you the tools. <laughs> I don't answer your questions. You know how to go about it now. Part of learning the deen is learning how to apply that deen in your life. So if you go somewhere and the majority is atheist now, would you eat that meat? Remember, you went to Thailand. The majority was not Christian. The majority was not Jewish, and there were no Muslims around in the example that we gave. So now you come to Canada, and there's no Muslims around. There are Jewish, there are Christians, but the majority are atheists. Would you eat the meat? Yes, Sarah, Sarah got it 100% right. This is what Sarah's saying, right? So that's where we are within learning our deen. Part of these classes is to learn to apply the deen in our lives. And I'm happy if at least some of us will apply what we learn, inshallah ta'ala. That's all the time that we have. Uh, Isha is in about seven minutes. Um, yes, of course. Now, now let's go back to reality, okay? Because some of you might be like, oh, oh, wait a second, something's wrong. Now let's go back to reality. Reality is that there are Muslims around, okay? There are Muslims around. There is certified kosher food, but remember, those of you that are thinking, oh, it's certified kosher, it's permissible for us to eat it, read the ingredients, because you'll find, and especially with airplane food, I've had this, I've had this in front of me, a plate or a tray of certified kosher food sealed completely, and I read the ingredients. Some certified kosher foods have alcohol in them. So don't think that something is kosher. Bismillah. You might find some alcohol in it. Just like if we were to say food of the Christians. Is there any alcohol in it? Right? Think of that. So don't just put blanket statements that, okay, khalas, kosher, bismillah, okay? Yes, sana, sometimes kosher food has alcohol in it. I remember being in an airplane the very first time. Everyone always says, my dad always says, order the kosher food. It's so much better than the Muslim meal. This was going back like in the early 2000s, right? When airplane food was absolutely nasty and disgusting, you know, the kosher meals were usually the meal to get. And I remember getting it and I'm reading through and I'm like, wait a second. So the main course has alcohol and this thing has alcohol. And I'm like, well, I can't eat any of this anyway. So what was the point of me getting that? Right. So subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Okay. Now. So no, she is like, wait a second, what do we do now? How do we know their belief and how do we judge? This is where we come down to what I'm going to leave with, leave with you before ending. Okay, What I leave with you is, we have so many halal options, alhamdulillah. So many halal options. Why is it that we as Muslims are not comfortable with the halal options we have? I can understand where some Muslims in Canada live in remote areas where there are no halal options for them. 
That's a different story. That's a completely different story. Let them deal with what they have to deal with. Let's talk about us, especially here in the GTA. We have so many halal food options, halal restaurants, you know, halal meat stores. Halal food is sold even in the regular grocery stores, right? You go to the grocery store, the meat and chicken aisles, you know, produce, you'll find halal meat and chicken there. Why do we need to resort to something else? If we know something is halal, buy the halal. Certified halal or from a Muslim, right? You go to the Muslim halal meat store and the Muslim, he might not have that stamp that you're looking for. Right? I'm not going to mention any names. Might not have that stamp that you're looking for. The Muslim is telling you it's halal. I got it from this place. Alhamdulillah. You do your homework. Do your homework if you need to do your homework. Right? But Bismillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for every single one of us. Uh, I really don't want to get into any debates with anyone. So don't start any debates with me afterwards. If you want to debate, go and eat from whatever stamp you prefer. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for every single one of us to learn our deen and to understand it in a way that we can apply it. And here's a sneak peek into an interesting thing that I'll, you know, I have so many, when I start thinking of travel, I have so many things that I want to share with you. I was in Taiwan. I was in Taiwan once and I was eating breakfast and there was nothing in the buffet that I could eat because they use lard to fry things, right? Instead of vegetable oil or even butter. So I thought to myself, salad. Salad had bacon bits on it. Scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs had bacon in it. I was like, subhanAllah, everything is haram. Like even the bread, the bread, the bread buns, right? The bread buns, the, 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 the butter that you would think is butter that's on top of it in order to give it that nice golden glaze, right? Is lard that they put on top. So it's like, you can't eat bread, you can't eat salad, you can't eat eggs, what am I gonna eat? So I went to the chef. I asked the waiter, can I speak to the chef? And I told the chef, I said, can you boil two eggs for me? He says, no, no problem. I can scramble them, I can do this, I could do that, and bacon. I'm like, no, 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 no bacon, nothing. No, nothing, no alcohol, nothing. Just boil two eggs for me and give me that. Can you do that? He said, yes, no problem. That's all you're going to eat? I said, yes, that's all I'm going to eat. And I'll have some apples and fruits and bananas and stuff like that. Alhamdulillah. So sometimes you go to countries and even the salad you can't eat, right? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for every single one of us to be able to travel this world and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for us there and also to implement our deen when we learn it, we try to implement it. Remember, we're just touching the surface of our deen. So what I'm teaching you here is just scraping the surface. We can go deeper and deeper. And I know, you know, some others might see this and be like, oh, but what about this, Shaykh? And what about that and this and that? Oh, yes, I know. But we're just touching the surface to take the general Islamic rules and principles of our deen. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullahu khayran wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.